Are psychology statements posted on the web real facts or more fiction? Does birth order have an effect on personality and intelligence? Something scientists have been trying to answer for more than 100 years? And how much does group conformance or influence impact the way we remember things? That's what we'll discuss in this video. Now to start out with, I'm by no means a psychologist or scientist myself. But what I do know is that with a lot of the information thrown out there on social media and the web, and the same goes for psychological statements, in order to see if it's true or not, you should ideally look at what the source is and where it's coming from. In a variety of cases, these statements have not been proved by any studies of reputable sources or institutes and can be more categorized as sensational or fake news. To understand why it's important that a statement is proven statistically in a sound and unbiased way is that without anyone can claim anything to be true. Let's take a simple example. If someone were to ask 10 women and 10 guys in their classroom whether they like the color red or blue, and out of the 10 women, six choose red, and of the guys only three. And next thing you know, this person puts a statement out on the internet saying, women in general like red over blue more than guys. Now, based on the way this study has been conducted, you would hopefully not believe this to be true. However, if the study were to include 1 million randomly chosen women and men of different ages, backgrounds, and across different, different geographies that were performed many times across a certain period, you'd probably already feel better about the results if this were the case. However, in this setup, the person may find out that perhaps in some cases there were more women that chose red over blue, and at other times more men. And that's really up to chance. This is where we get into the field of statistics and statistical analysis involving p-values and null hypothesis, which I won't go into, but suffice to say that sample size is an important factor, which often used to be an issue because especially in the past, before the dawn of the computer era and big databases, it was often hard in studies to find enough data with specific characteristics or people that were willing to participate in the study, including at times having a control group to compare your results with, ideally also with similar characteristics as the people that you're observing. There's also the issue of bias, as you don't want to select only people that, for example, are only men or women of a certain age if you want to make a general statement for old people. Interestingly enough, there has actually been a study published in Science Magazine titled estimating the reproducibility of psychological science that replicated a hundred psychological studies and fewer than half got to the same result. They concluded that a large portion of replications produced weaker evidence for the original findings despite using materials provided by the original authors. Weaker evidence in this context means that on average they measured half of the effect which was, which was produced in the original study. Imagine that in case of our example, 60% of the women chose red over blue with smaller sample sizes of let's say 50 people, and now redoing the study only 30% of the women would choose red over blue. Why is this important? Because reproducibility is very important in science as it essentially indicates that everyone can reproduce the same results with the conditions outlined in the study so that it's not just a matter of coincidence or pure chance. The authors of the article concluded that in general, more verification needs to be done of what we have been led to believe, and I totally agree with them, especially in this day and age when everyone can post something so easily on the web. However, there was a follow-up article on this one posted by others that stated that this study in specific used different samples of subjects with different characteristics as the original study and that also the methods were different leading to results of failure. Okay, let's look at one of the studies regarding personality traits and birth order. 
Does the birth order have a lasting effect on someone's personality? This is something that scientists were fascinated by for more than 100 years. The first study was performed in 1874 by Francis Galton and found out that among the English scientists at that time, a lot of them were firstborns. There were also several studies published in 1968 and 1980, of which the former concluded that siblings that were born first were less likely to participate in dangerous sports because of fear or physical injury. And the 1980 study consisting of 170 female and 142 male undergraduates concluded that firstborns tended to have lower anxiety and a higher ego. However, the methods that were used in those studies were questionable. For example, only one sibling had to often assess themselves and their other sibling in terms of their behavior like openness to experiences, tolerance, neuroticism, extroversion, etc. The issue is that the way you look at yourself is usually different than someone else perceives you. Another issue was that the test was only done once at a point in their life when they were an adolescent and became more conscientious. A later study that was performed in 2015 by the University of Leipzig in Germany, which involved a larger sample size of roughly 20,000 people from the US, Britain and Germany, concluded that there is no effect related to birth order on personality traits like extroversion, emotional stability, agreeableness, conscientiousness or imagination. They did, however, notice a slightly higher measured and self-reported intelligence for firstborns. In that same year, coincidentally or not, a massive study of 377,000 U.S. high school students performed by the University of Illinois indicated that there was a statistical significant difference in personality or intelligence between firstborns and their later siblings, but that the difference was very small. For example, the absolute difference in intelligence between firstborns and laterborns was just one IQ point. Something similar but at even a smaller scale was the case for personality traits. What I liked about this study personally was the big sample size, but also that they accounted for different age, gender, number of siblings, socioeconomic status and family structure. In general, my own belief now based on these studies would be that there is no significant difference in personality traits or intelligence based on birth order among a group of siblings. By the way, let me know if you like this type of video or not so that I know if I have to make more of these. In any case, don't forget to subscribe and help my channel grow. Okay, let's do one more for the roads. Before that, answer this question. In a social group setting, do you in general align in your responses to what others are saying what actually happened or what they remembered of specific things or events, even if you remembered it differently? There actually has been a study done for this and published in 2011 in Science Magazine titled Following the Crowd, Brain Substrates of Long-Term Memory Conformity. In that study, they were actually trying to determine to what degree memories of an individual is skewed by social pressures, mass media exposure and eyewitness testimony. In their study, they recognized two types of memory errors. One was legitimate because of social influences that a person's memory got erroneously altered and this person really believed in this memory. But the other one was that a person just wanted to comply or fit in with a bigger social group with an erroneous memory of which he or she knew was wrong. The way they conducted the study was in four phases and as follows. During a two week period, they split a group of 30 individuals into groups of five. They then showed each group an eyewitness style documentary on a large screen. After three days, they asked each individual in the lab to complete the memory test consisting of 400 questions and two answers. This was just to set a baseline as to what they remembered with confidence, which could either be low, medium 
or high, with high having an 80.2% accuracy. Another four days later, each participant returned again to answer the same questions. They only took 320 random questions in this case to minimize scanning time. But this is the phase where some manipulation to test conformity was introduced. For 80 questions out of the 320 that were previously answered with mid to high confidence before responding, false answers were presented to them and they were led to believe that these were given by the four fellow co-observers in their group. For the remaining questions, 25 of them were not manipulated and they just showed an X for the co-observers answers. And for 215, some of the co-observers answers had different patterns and were not all in disagreement with the participant's memory. And this was just to make it more credible so that the test subject wouldn't suspect anything. One week later, the participants were told that the answers given by their co-observers were determined randomly and they were again asked to do the memory test. Out of this test, it turned out that in 68.3% of the manipulation trials, participants gave a false answer to questions they answered correctly before. The last test also revealed that in 59.2% of those cases, participants referred back to their original answer without social influence. So another way to interpret this is that there's approximately a 40% chance that an average participant would conform in their responses to social influence. Now, obviously, there was a lot more complexity and subtleties that were discussed in the study that I cannot possibly cover in this video, like control studies, brain activities, MRI scans and analysis, reaction times, persistent and transient errors, but I'll leave a link to the article in case you're interested in more details. Though the results were interesting, not everything was clear to me from the beginning, so I actually contacted one of the scientists to verify some of my understandings. Okay, I hope you found this interesting. Please subscribe to my channel and like the video if you did. It will be very helpful to me also to provide you with more videos about interesting facts.